at the business community uh, for enterprise information management. And I am program kind certified and also Six Sigma Greek and certified. Uh, in my career, I've worked both in sales facing and uh, pre-sales type of role as part of the practices and the centers of excellence that I've incepted. And also as part of various project deliveries. So I've seen the programs both from the perspective of the customer and the business and from the delivery standpoint. So I'll try to uh, share some more light on this uh, topic today. So uh, the topic that we have is, is it necessary for to have someone from the business side as part of the program management board? Um, so let's look at first what is a program board? Uh, as per the things to sort of terminology, what we have is uh, there is a senior responsible owner, who is typically the person who is sponsoring the program. And then you have uh, the program board which is comprised of the business change managers uh, and also of the portfolio manager. Uh, that is an optional role, but primarily you have the business change managers, the program manager and uh, also the design authority. Uh, the project board then comprises of the project teams and so on and so forth. So if we, if we look at the very reason why we have the uh, program board, the idea is to always align to the vision of the program. Uh, so typically all programs are uh, linked in some way to some transformation initiatives these days. Say for example finance transformation, HR transformation and so on. So uh, the first purpose is to be aligned with that end vision. Uh, then the program management board is also responsible to uh, to make provisions for resources or to identify the risks that are uh, in daily as part of the program and its delivery. Uh, in terms of the uh, responsibilities of the PMB, one of the critical things is to create the business uh, realization plan, the benefit realization plan, which will ensure that the program is aligned with the business objectives at all points in time. Uh, in terms of the decision making, the recognition of budgeting, uh, etc., there is a tremendous amount of stakeholder management which the PMB does uh, by engaging with the right, uh, right partners of the business and making sure that the project team has the uh, adequate resources to work upon. So that's the sort of high level uh, overview of the PMB. Let's look at some industry statistics. So why we are discussing this topic today is as many as 74% of all programs are challenged in some way. Challenged by way of scope, challenged by way of time, challenged by way of resources. So it's very important to understand uh, why we need a program management board, how it can work more effectively. Uh, in terms of some of the statistics provided by Gartner, for example, 50% programs are actually rolled back out of production, which is very, very, um, uh, I think it's a very uncanny number, but it is true. So uh, that, that tells you that Things that go into production may not even be close to what was originally perceived. So what went wrong? Uh, likewise, Carnegie Mellon uh, University says that 25 to 40 percent of all programs goes into rework. Why do they go into rework? So uh, the bottom line is that the programs have the power to even diminish an organization on a, on a very uh, large scale, and hence it's very paramount to understand how the PMP can help in that process. With that, I'll pass on to Shrikant. Yes, thank you, Shamshri, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, start with the introduction. Uh, my name is Shrikant Dixit. Uh, I am uh, working with uh, Skiria. Uh, I have uh, a total of 23 years of experience uh, in the program delivery. Uh, I have also been supporting the sales, pre sales activities. Uh, the domains that I have uh, typically supported, uh, especially in the last uh, few years, has been finance. Uh, I have also supported retail and manufacturing. Uh, Technology-wise, uh, fairly uh, uh, large spread of uh, areas I've covered, including digital as the recent times, uh, mainframes, Oracle Labs, um, C Unix, and so on. In terms of geographies, I've worked both uh, in India, US, as well as in UK. <coughs> now, coming to the uh, uh, topic, uh, as uh, the background, if we want to really look at what exactly we are really trying, trying to touch on. Uh, there are some very interesting industry facts that we need to consider when we are talking about this debate. Uh, as per IBM, uh, only 40% of the products are really uh, meeting the budget and the quality goals. Okay? Uh, when there are, if you look at these numbers, like Portland Business Journal, they have found certain numbers that 65-80% products fail. 
And even if you look at the data which was presented by Shamashi, I mean, the summary again, I, my intention was not to you know, just uh, focus on one specific uh, data, but the intention of the whole crux of this discussion is the industry is seeing a lot of situations where projects and programs are actually failing. What we need to understand is what is the reason that these failures are happening? What are the core components behind it? What are the steps that we can take to correct this situation? Uh, if we really look at the uh, topic of debate today, what we are trying to understand is the roles of IT and the business. The core topic that we are touching on is, should someone from business really be uh, part of the program? The question is, what is this someone? Can it really be a someone person really coming into the business? Or do we really need a key SME really stepping into that kind of a program. I think that's the core question that we need to understand. We all know that business and IT are important. They are key pillars of any program to be successful. The question is, who really anchors what, at what point, and do they really understand where they really need to contribute to make that program successful? I think that's the core that we really need to understand. What we also need to really understand is, all programs are unique in nature. You can't really apply a factory shop concept or the way I have written here, one rule apply all doesn't work. Every situation, every customer, everyone has a priority to work on and that's what is going to be the key basis in deciding what kind of whole business picks up and what IT really picks up. So these are again some statistics that we would like to uh, uh, touch on. And these are the challenges and surveys if you look at, generally do a Google on it, you will see the number of situations, number of examples where programs have failed because of one reason or the other, number of surveys and number of studies have been done and those are just general statistics. So with that introduction, we will go on to the next uh, subsequent topic uh, of actual for and against. I will be speaking against the topic, so I will basically be saying why business presence is not really required or what is the crux behind that that needs to be considered for program to be successful. Thank you, Shikhan. <coughs> so, uh, let's look at how a program board is organized. So, at the top of it, you have a sponsoring group, and then you have the program board. So, the sponsoring group is often the, uh, the, the very people to whom you sold the business case of the program in the first place. And it's very important that the program board consistently uh, appraises the sponsoring group on how the objectives have been met how close we are, how far we are from, from the set objectives. So the, the very first uh, point of focus is the business objectives that we set out to achieve. And of course the PMB has to be a very consensus seeking group. It has to have some right connects. I would like to highlight the word connect because I think 50% of the programs fail also due to the lack of sponsorship from the business organization. And how to get sponsorship? By of course engaging with the right st stakeholders by telling them and appraising them of what's happening in their programs. Uh, the, the PMB is also supposed to have, uh, to you know, sort of erect the procedures and the guiding principles that the program is supposed to follow. And uh, more importantly, it has to work on the investment uh, the case that was originally set up and make sure that the benefits realized at each tranche is well established and well socialized with the business segment. If you do not socialize what benefits are being achieved, then very soon the sponsors lose interest in what's happening in the program. And in all uh, possibility, probably when you go to the change management state, uh, they, they may lose faith on the whole program itself. So that's the overall perspective. Uh, next please. So this is uh, my view of the uh, of why we should not have a, of why we should have a business involvement at every step of the program, and why there should be someone within the PMP itself uh, to drive the program. So if you if you look at how a project starts or how a program starts, first we have, we identify a strategic change. That strategic change may be something like uh, employ the uh, increase the cross sell to the customers. Suppose, for instance. So that definition of cross-sell then rolls out to separate several programs which may be, you know, to improve my uh, single view of the customer or to have a better customer understanding, etc, etc. And then the programs, of course, translate to the program objectives and which then, you know, uh, seed several different projects. 
So what holds the whole hem? The whole hem is held by the benefits. So what did you originally set out to achieve? And that's why a benefit realization plan is the only and the key deliverable from the program management board. As per the Prince 2, uh, for all practical purposes, the PMP is uh, involved in uh, reviewing the project progress, in understanding the risks, costing them out, etc. But the key deliverable that it has to produce is the benefit realization plan. And that cannot be done, of course, without having someone who understands the business, not only understands the business, but who originally understood the whole business case for that program. The other, uh, uh, if you look at some of the Gartner surveys, 66% of the programs did not meet their business objectives. Why did they not meet their business objects, uh, objectives? Did they not have the right technical teams involved? Of course not. In all likelihood, all such programs are led by very capable people. Why did it still fail? Because there was no single person to anchor the story between the IT and the business. There was nobody to say that uh, this is how the business objectives may be translated. Let's also look at some of the other statistics. 20% of technology investments, I am now talking about technology investments and not programs in particular, 20% of them never obtained any benefit whatsoever. Why? Because maybe those investments were done in isolation by the IT team for instance. So at the end of this whole program, the critical bit is the voice of the customer. In today's time of recession, I think the most important parameter I think which came out from some of the other debates in the past is of course of cost, time, quality and so on. Occasionally, even if you if you look at the change data, there's a huge amount of change requests which come into the programs typically nowadays. Some of the projects are uh, an outcome of change requests itself. And why does that happen? Because originally when the program was uh, laid out, no one socialized with the business to understand how they could change their program implementations basically changing business requirements. So it all boils down to that ecosystem. It all boils down to the need of having the business requirements and the voice of the customer and a, a person from the sponsoring group who has the faith in the program. So the business must be present in the PMP. Thank you, Samshin. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the uh, IT and the business are the two key pillars. I think that's uh, very, very important. So uh, one of the uh, key things I would like to really touch on uh, is the point that is mentioned in the topic is it is necessary to have someone from business side to be part of the program management team or program board. My whole uh, focus is really on having a someone. I think what we have been always diluting is can we really just have someone or somebody coming from business and trying to tell us. That is where I think the biggest program failures have really happened. I will come on to like you know some uh, examples, let's start with those examples, I think that is where uh, the key uh, essence will really come out. Uh, some of the industry facts that I have listed on the right hand side, leadership on governance area, if you look at, uh, you know there was a uh, program which was done related to US uh, Census Bureau in 2010. The program was initiated in 21, it's a 10 year program, the cost was about US dollar 10 billion. The concept was to use handheld devices. And uh, the core issue that really was missed out here was business was trying to achieve those goals. Business was very much into it. It was the US government initiative. The business was definitely in the driver's seat there. What really went wrong was they took the devices which they were trying to pick up. Those devices were not properly analyzed. Can they really capture all kinds of elements? Have all the elements actually been captured there? By the time they started the initiative, by about 2006, after almost about five and a half years, they realized that the device was not really capable to capture all the data which was required to do the actual census. And that's where I feel that having someone is not important. You need to understand like who that person really is and to what level the IT team has to be involved to make the program successful. The second example that I have talked about is about Sinclair. It's again a UK project which was, you know, and with a fantastic initiative of having a, a personalized transportation. The issue there again was, business was in place, there was enough budget available in there, but then the IT was not really taking the right kind of place in the entire program. What was the core issue there? Why did the whole thing actually fail? This project was initiated in UK. 
It was a vehicle which was designed to run on a battery. It was an open vehicle. In UK it rains. Nobody really thought about that. There were certain devices that were installed there which were not capable of accepting those kind of data. That is where certain coordination that was required between IT and business was completely failing in that area as well. Similarly, in organizational planning areas, if you look at, there was a uh, program related to FBI virtual cases, again 170 million US dollars. So large programs failing because of uncontrolled changes with complete lack of coordination in IT. The last one again, I think I'll quickly touch on, that's again adoption of ERP was actually being done. This is a drug company in US where they actually tried to adopt ERP without really understanding did that ERP solution have the necessary elements to cover all aspects of the business goals. Business have very ambitious plan, a fantastic goal in hand. Right persons were probably there in that particular place, but was IT consulted? Probably not to an enough level. The question again is, can just one person who is coming up with a fantastic idea really work? And that's where my first point, if I come to, it cannot be someone. You can, business actually hatches a program. They come, come up with a fantastic idea with a particular goal that they want to have for the customer. But then, it is the IT team which actually puts everything into action. Use of the right uh, technology is extremely vital. You are talking about an organization, stop line and bottom line. You have to make sure that the technology which is chosen is the right choice which has all the elements to capture and to give all the kinds of required outputs to the business. Until that time, you will never be confident that the output that will be coming out of that system will be in line with the goals that which you have actually started out the program. Another important factor that you need to consider here is the cost considerations. Many times, when you have someone from the business driving it, they typically tend to look at the cost aspects of it. Now, when you say it's expensive or when it is costly, the question is, is it the required cost? Your aim is to basically to get a flexible and robust system in place. Your intention is not to just have a system in place. You want to have a robust and for that if you need to add some more cost to it, it is actually justified. Other two points that I would like to quickly cover are excessive focus on deadlines. Many times issues related to third parties or any priorities that are related to processes or even related to certain uh, commitments that are there or from the government side, they are also ignored. Last but not the least, there are sometimes double standards which are also seen where business tries to see, like say for example in agile approach, they do get a benefit that yes, I have an ability to change the requirements at any point in time. But then when it comes to assigning an SME or a key decision maker, that's when the failures happen. That's the reason I feel that having someone from business is not important. Business definitely has to have an important role to play, but it has to be a proper coordinated effort between the right business person and the IT team. Thank you. Uh, going back to some of the metrics you have stated, uh, you said that there was this U.S. Sensor uh, Bureau uh, uh, program and it failed because the device, device was not capable of doing some of the things. So that in itself is, it proves that the business goals were not met in a way. So someone has a fancy gadget and they say, think they could do something with it. I don't think uh, that we are referring here to that someone, you know, someone any Tom Dick Harry, it is some knowledgeable self, of course, from the business. But the point is, do we need that business vetting or do we not? So probably this device uh, was not suitable. The second example, sorry, the second example that you stated was that the adoption of ERP for a pharma company. From as much as I know about the pharma companies, ERP is a very hard sell thing, only uh, apart from sales and marketing. So in all probability, the business was not consulted if they need an ERP. It's like prescribing a headache pill to someone who got a fever. Okay. To answer your point, I think it's a, uh, a specific area where you talked about on the uh, US consensus side. Uh, the issue that was there in that particular project was business did come up with a clear goal that yes, I want to have uh, you know a consensus done without the paper. Okay. So uh, that's why I'm saying that the person came up with a fantastic idea, but did that person, and the reason I'm calling that person as someone is because the person has not taken the entire perspective of it. 
when you want to run such an ambitious program and that to for the entire US population, you have to make sure that you have the capability to handle that program in an effective way. And that is where I feel the person who actually came up with an ambitious goal did not really look at the aspects that do I really have the right kind of technology when I am talking about moving away from pen and paper? Do I have the right kind of device? Have I actually looked at the aspects that once I captured the data? Are all elements captured? How do I really transport those captured data into the actual core system which will actually be used eventually? Those were the aspects where I felt that the, not I felt, that's where the reason why the US government felt that the program had to be cancelled because the devices and the IT team was not really taken into the proper consideration. It was someone who came up with a bright idea but was not able to visualize the entire complications of the entire program. Right. But, um, you know, Shikhan, what I feel is, uh, okay, someone had that right idea. The onus of doing that implementation on how to go about that right idea is, again, you know, something that IT should have done. If they did not do that, then it is in all likelihood, and since you mentioned it was a 10-year program, in all likelihood they did not socialize well enough with that ideator who said that we want to use, uh, instead of the pen and paper, some handheld devices. Let's go back to the original basic definition of the program code. So, suppose uh, you are uh, suppose you are uh, part of the program board, you are chairing the program board, and the IT tells you uh, somewhere down the line that uh, there is a risk in achieving this program for whatever reasons. You now have to go and socialize with your business and make sure that you can, uh, you can carry on with the program because of course that is your mandate. So if you are not connected with the business sector, if you are not one of them, how will you make sure that that change is addressed, that risk is addressed? No, absolutely. I think uh, the debate is not about connecting with the business country. I think what I am trying to talk about is, uh, when you talk about business representation, I think we have always been very generic about it. When the programs are being talked about, you say that, okay, program runs, okay, you need to have two people, business is important, IT is important. I think that's what all we have been focusing on. Business typically, today if you look at any project or a program, uh, if you go to business and say, okay, do we have somebody to call somebody to represent the program? First answer is probably we are busy. Okay? Even if they are able to devote someone, there is someone who is actually given to you who probably does not really understand the whole program in a good perspective. And secondly, more importantly, may not have an ability to make a decision for you. That's exactly my point. That's where the failures really happen. It's not about, I'm fully convinced about the fact that business really needs to step in. But the point is about someone being there. That's where I have always been touching about. Now, one, uh, one other thing I just wanted to touch on some points that you touched, uh, talked about. You know, when you say that, uh, you know, business needs to, uh, uh, needs to be there in the program board. Now, we are in a world where, uh, you know, IT is kind of driving all the things. I mean, uh, we have seen so many debates, we have seen the world around us. People have talked about, you know, cloud, they have talked about internet taking, you know, uh, such large leaps. Uh, with business being there, and business typically has always seen as resistance to change. Anything you try to tell the business, because this is a fantastic tool that I have got, and it will change the world for you, there has always been a resistance. From that perspective, do you not see that we having a business person there, you know, sometimes actually can the declaration? Okay, so Shikhan, I take two steps back. Let's assume that uh, the IT are smarter for one moment, and let's assume that the business does not have an inkling of the innovation they are talking about. When does the program board come into view? When the business case is approved. When is the business case approved? When the innovation has been shared and the business says, okay, wow, this is very fancy, let's go for it. And that's the time when the program board comes into being. So at that time, there's no question of innovation because innovation is done, fantastic. There was an IT guy who brought the idea of big data, handle, whatever, great. But the business agrees with that and then you went ahead with the program. So once the program board comes into being, Thereafter, it's important to make sure whatever was the original seed of the idea, in all possibility that ideator is not going to be part of the program because he, may, he or she may be you know, somebody, somebody part of the R&D, suppose. So at that time, that, some, that representation, that correct representation from your business needs to be there in your program board to make sure whatever you set out to achieve has been achieved. 
So if you see, what they have is a, is a strategy and investment board, they have a program management board, and they have an IT management board, which is this sort of area that Shrikant was referring to. But that block in between, the IT program management board actually has NASA's own agency people. So I'm, I'm sure you will all agree with me, NASA is state of the art, so therefore I decided to become NASA. And uh, why do they have that? Because they need executive oversight in the decisions. You cannot have, I mean, you know, of course we will have a business representative who is capable of being at that uh, program management board chair, of course, but that is a very diluted and, you know, smaller part of it. The bigger uh, crux is that you need the PNB to be always uh, updating the CXOs, for example, on what is the what is the state of the program, whether it is viable, whether it is meeting my business objectives, and only then this can be taken forward. And if you know, please go back to my conclusion slide. So my view is that the PNB is an advisory body, and for being an advisory body, it must be aware of the critical business goals that I am planning to meet. And it must be focused on, of course, the principles, which is uh, part IT and part business, because the principles may be, you know, principles about the investment, principles about uh, deciding a go-no-go, -no -go, principles about architecture, and that's why we have the design authority as well. Uh, and then, you know, we also have the uh, authority on checking viability. How do you check viability? If you are in IT, and if, you know, the program management board only represents IT, you have no idea on what is viability. How will you calculate viability because you don't know what the strategy is like? So hence, I feel that uh, the PNB is the, uh, however, you know, PNB is of course the official voice of the project. So it's also, as one of the functions, supposed to go back and say to the, communicate to the steering group that uh, what should be done and you know whether the program should continue, etc. And my personal opinion on this topic is that everything in today's world of recession starts with a business case. Uh, I'm sure Shrikant will agree with me, we write tons of business cases even in Steria. So everything starts from there. And the uh, the whole perspective of quality has also changed a bit. Quality is not just delivering a piece of code right now. So quality also means delivering something which is fit for business use. Otherwise, you are going to have the cost of rework. So everything boils down to the fact that you need a relevant business representation in the program management board and who should be with you all the time to ensure that the objectives are well aligned and the program is viable. So I think the PMP is the whistleblower and also the flag bearer of an organization. Shrikant. Thank you, Samshri. Uh, my conclusions are uh, uh, in line, you know, as I said, like business and IT are the two key pillars. So again, uh, Touching on to the points of debate that we were talking about, I think there is no conflict as such there. But then I think what is important is success of the program is primary. That's my conclusion. If you look at that, success is the, of the program is primary. We can always keep fighting about who from business really comes in or what from IT. And I think when you want to make a program successful, the core thing is we have to tap the expertise of both at right points. You need to make sure that the business is tapped at the right point, at the right places, they need to take the right kind of calls, right kind of decisions, at the right points of the programs. And similarly, IT needs to step, step in, use their expertise and make sure that the program is actually made successful. When you talk about the goals of, if you look at, remember some of the case studies which I highlighted, goals have to be realistic. So when you set up the goals, and uh, uh, touching on the program uh, management board that we talk about, Goals also need to have a reality check. Are you really targeting a realistic goal? That's also very, very important. Continuous coordination. I think that's something which is always seen as an important aspect of it. So that's something which I really, really feel that is many times missing and which are really the cause of failures in certain kind of large, large programs. <clears throat> what we also need to understand looking at the last bullet is Certain assumptions are many times made. When you are talking of certain programs being delivered, you keep assuming that yes, this is something which is kind of granted, either in terms of technology or in terms of acceptance from the business side. That's where the assumptions and the results, they both need to be validated. You need to really understand, when you talk of a success, has the project or a program been a success? How do you really define it? How do you really say is it successful? That is where I think goals, assumptions, results, 
don't need to be validated and that's why it becomes really very critical. My personal opinion on this topic is again participation of business SME and a key decision maker is must. And that's where my always an objection about someone being there. Okay? What is important is the person should be able to understand the complexity, the actual goals, the feasibility aspects of it and should be able to make a decision if a conflict comes into play, whether it is related to cost, whether it is in terms of schedule, whether it is in terms of quality compromise as well at certain times. Second is, business of course need to work hand in hand with IT, right expertise needs to be tapped at the right time, validation of goals are absolutely important, continuous checks are very very important, again not from just IT perspective or from uh, the business perspective, both of them need to step in and actually validate. And finally, as I said in the beginning, goal is success. Okay, it's not about IT or about the business. What we are trying to achieve is basically a flexible, robust and working system meeting the customer and organization's needs. That's the summary which I would like to uh, conclude with. Thank you.
is uh, you will find lots of very young CIOs because they can think out of the ordinary rocket science. Uh, so you know you'll, you'll still find lots of people who understand rocket science very young. But um, how many people would understand business at say you know some mid thirties? I doubt. I think I would agree with that. Uh, I think uh, that goal becomes difficult. It is more aligned towards what uh, business is, what customers' pulse is. So I think from that perspective, I think that goal is more prominent. And uh, maybe yes, as uh, you know, I already said that CMIO is probably something which is probably the uh, thing in the future. But yes, if you need to really make a choice, probably CMO is the one. I'm touching on the same question. If you Look at the uh, you know companies, technology companies who have actually made big. Whether it is Sony, Philips, Apple, Microsoft, these were all started by you know so to say techies, right? Gradually they picked up the business, and today also if you see the expectation and demands from the project managers who are in technical and is that they start understanding business. They are there is a culture of developing entrepreneurship, right? You come up with your ideas and run a business. So these people have, whether it is Akio Morita or, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, whoever, these people have made their business excellently because they know what they are doing. So don't you think that uh, CIO will be a better person to move a switch over to business rather than the other way around? Uh, yeah, I think the point is well taken in terms of, you know, like taking that leap in terms of technology. However, having said that, uh, I think what we are talking about is when you are talking about a company making big, I think the core issue there is understanding the market. What is what is it that really customer is really asking for? If you are trying to make an innovative product as a concept, as a future activity, maybe you have really done well. You probably are a technology organization, but unless you are able to leverage that technology to benefit an end customer, I think that's where the success of your organization itself may not really come out. That's what my opinion is. Yeah, in fact, you know, um, if, you, if you look back at the examples that you quoted, they are more in terms of the technology that enables. Say, for example, um, you know, uh, having some data science stuff. So, let's take Hadoop. So, Hadoop is more of a technology mm -hmm. enabler as of now, until the time it is put to business use. If it is not put to business use, I'm sure it's going to die five years down the line. So the key thing is that uh, at the end of the day, whatever innovations you might have taken out, that's that's great in that segment. But you need to define the ocean where you are going to sell that. Because uh, there are plenty of innovations that did not have a taker. I don't know what you think about the Google Glass, but very soon it's going to get into lots of issues related to ethics, this, that, and therefore it will take some more time to bear flight. I'm not saying it will not bear flight. It will probably. But at that time, you will have a business taker for Google Glass who will define how to use the Google Glass because you are running some um, searches as, as of now. So I think entrepreneurship through technology enablement is fantastic. But technology enablement will not go a long way if you don't have the business to back it up. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much uh, for the uh, insightful knowledge you made, so I just wanted to pick up and make attention to what Mr. Gaudi has just observed. Uh, probably that someone has uh, taken more stress. Uh, and even the ones who just pointed a few uh, examples like the Microsoft, the Sony, and the other. If we look at historically, uh, all innovations uh, uh, prospered with the support of business. That, that, that had been history, and that's history, and that's, I believe that's going to stay right, as is. Right? Uh, and that makes up the context of like, who should be the CMO or the CEO. Second point I would like to bring here is, uh, you uh, just attributed uh, the, the change aspect. Right? Any time you bring a uh, change to the existing processes or procedures, there's a resistance. Is it an attribution to a generic, uh, as a generic resistance to change, or is it something from the Board function of it, uh, board function as in from the uh, from the uh, representation of IT or IT representation of the business. So I think uh, what I am referring there to is uh, when you are looking at any program, especially when you are talking of uh, 
several radical changes that are coming in. Now, uh, when I say radical, I mean there are again two levels to it. Within our normal day-to-day -day IT programs that we look at, uh, when you come up with a new product or a new way of working certain things or doing capturing certain data or the way it is being presented or the way they have to actually get certain information out from a system, uh, when you look at a different way of working, that's where typical resistance really comes in. And it's not necessarily just with the business. Maybe that's a human nature, I would say. But I think when business typically looks at it, I think there's a large set of population based on which they are, uh, who are taking decisions, who are making certain vital uh, you know, uh, inputs from these systems and are making certain calls, which are very important for the organization to get to a successful level or a failure level. Again, it may not be just one and zero, but the amount of level or uh, amount of success or failure. And that's where the change could actually be uh, something which will be seen as a uh, you know, detriment or something which will be seen with resistance. And especially when it is a radical change, when you are moving from one set of an application to a completely different approach, or from let's say a legacy application to a completely a cloud-based approach or a web-based approach, there is bound to be some kind of a, a resistance which is going to come in. That's what we are talking about. I just have a last point. Uh, in today's context, where uh, uh, most of the businesses uh, are uh, coming up with the support yeah. from uh, external uh, funding, the venture capitalists or the PE and you know, anything, likewise. Like, uh, in, in those, even, even those firms, those institutions, they do have their own management boards uh, who makes a decision whether to put in money or not on the unspecified project, obviously, which is technology based project. So uh, what sort of uh, uh, expectation one should have from that kind of board, the composition? Should it have a business? Should it have uh, IT? Or should it be dominated by IT? Should it be dominated by business? Uh, I think uh, in the debate that we uh, just had, I think that topic was uh, fairly actively touched on. I think there is, uh, if you really look at it, I think there is no, no, there are no two views about the sense of both IT and uh, business being there that can be. It's extremely important. I think what we have been always debating about is who needs to play the role at what time. I think that is what I think my view really there is. Each one has to play an important role. Who plays with which kind of a role at what point? And who is the one which actually decides the success and the failure? That's my view.